Hey guys, how's it going? So, um, you, you guys here to talk about monkeys or? Monster Hunter has a hugely diverse roster of monsters in it, and those monsters are classified into their own specific groups to give them a bit of coherency where needed. Most of the ones that come to mind are probably your elder dragons and your flying wyverns and all those lizardy boys, but one of the most diverse groups that they've ever made has got to be the Fanged Beasts. This group has had a bunch of different iterations, design focuses, and even name changes over the years, though I think they have still managed to maintain a strong identity. And today, I'd like to talk about them, so let's not waste any time, let's take a look at where the Fanged Beasts came from, and what they've become today. Starting with Generation 1, and... Okay, okay, this is not the strongest start, but there is a reason for that. And that reason is that technically, the Fang Beasts did not exist yet. That said, there is still a Gen 1 monster that is a Fang Beast because it got reclassified later on, and that is, of course, everyone's favourite little piggy, Bullfanger. Originally, it was put with the likes of Aptonoth and Mosswine to be considered a herbivore, but got the Fang Beast treatment in every generation from 2 onwards. There's not much to say about Bullfanger, really. It's notorious in the fanbase. It's a pig, it charges at you, and then it turns around and it charges at you again. Very one note. Very effective at being a pain in the ass. Moving along. Alright, okay, the proper Fanged Beast debut happened here in Generation 2. Uh, sort of. Kinda. You see, whilst the class began properly in Gen 2, it was not yet called Fang Beast. The original translation for this group was Primatius, due to the vast majority of the monsters in it being monkeys or monkey adjacent. If I had to, I would probably characterize them by being very fast moving, generally smaller than monsters at a similar threat level, and having smaller counterpart monsters alongside them, similar to your raptor bird wyverns. Unfortunately, that last point does not continue past the second generation. So you might be thinking, what monsters were the first ones to show up? First on our list is the Kongalala and its Conga. Fantastic names, I know. Kongalala is one of those monsters that is certainly a great example of the light-hearted nature of the entire Monster Hunter series. Visually, it's almost a complete and utter mess, but it somehow all comes together to make a really iconic monster in my mind. A big gorilla with a huge gut, hippo-like head, long prehensile tail, huge claws, and a horn-shaped hair tuft on its head? Oh, and did I mention it's bright pink as well. Clumsy and heavy-handed, Kongalala's whole gimmick is that it carries a mushroom or some other food item around in its tail, which it will periodically stop to eat. If you let it finish, it will adopt an ability to inflict different status effects with its breath based on the food that it ate. Pretty cool, right? Oh, and it also farts on everything. Can't forget that little detail. Its smaller counterparts, the Kongas, are exactly that. Smaller, but they do still fight and charge and swipe and fart, and do all that kind of stuff just on a smaller scale. Overall, Kongalala is solid, fun, and interesting. Certainly a memorable debut for the class, I'd say. Then we of course step it up a notch as we move on to the Blango and the Blangonga. Visually, these guys kind of remind me of a mix between a mandrill and a Japanese macaque, with fully white fur, long whiskers, and a vibrant red and blue face with huge fangs. It's an immediately different vibe compared to Kongalala. This thing is fast, agile, and very aggressive. Its attack patterns consist of relentlessly charging and diving at the hunter, hurling ice into the sky to crush you and freezing you into a walking snowman. It can also actively summon members of its pack, the Blango. The Blango themselves are much like what the Conga are to the Congalala, smaller versions of the Blangonga that can actually be pretty impactful and annoying in battle when your focus is elsewhere. The Blangang... Blanging? The Blangonga fight is actually likely to be a bit of a wall for those experiencing the second generation for the first First time, and for those who haven't faced this thing, picture it as a lesser, frostier version of the much more widely known Rajang. Speaking of which, alright, it's time for the big guy this early in the video. Getting the main event over and done with here. Probably the most iconic monster of this entire class. Big Baboon Boy Rajang is known by all, and to say its reputation precedes it is probably an understatement. Rajang is a big ass ape with big ass horns and a big ass attitude that also goes super saiyan whenever it fancies to do so. With strength to rival elder dragons, Rajang are relentless in their offense, notoriously being one of the most difficult fights the series offers in the old school Monster Hunter games. They have their regular mode where they are that deep brown color, their rage mode which, as I said before, sends them super saiyan as their hair stands on end and turns bright gold, and then, as if that weren't enough, 
they then have their rampage mode, where they get even angrier and their fists begin to glow bright red and become rock solid. Rajang is the OG invader monster, showing up whenever and wherever it feels like to ruin your day. I really like Rajang. I mean, what's not to like? And I think that that sentiment echoes throughout the community pretty well, even if it can be a pretty tough fight. I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that it is a monkey. It's not a giant dragon or a wyvern or a dinosaur, just a monkey with a foul temper. Rajang deserves respect, even if Rise did gut him a little bit. All right, okay, fine. Let's talk about the one I was avoiding, the one that is technically the very first Fang Beast large monster that you will see in the entire series, the Bull Drone. So you guys remember the Bullfanger? You know, the one I mentioned earlier, Pig charges a lot, not really liked by the community. Okay, so take that and imagine it like twice the size with a big white mohawk. And yeah, you have the Bulldrome. Nothing really to say. I don't think there are many Bulldrome fans out there. It leaves a bit to be desired, and it certainly makes it weird that at this stage is in the class called Primadius. Just a bit strange. Moving on. Okay, so that does it for entirely brand new monsters, as of Monster Hunter Dose. But fear not, I haven't forgotten the variations given to us at the tail end of Gen 2 in Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Freedom Unite, the game that can do no wrong for those who love their classic style Monster Hunter, this was the first time we got the new translation for the class, now being called the Pelagus instead of the Primatius. Don't ask me why, I don't know what it's supposed to mean. I googled some Latin and some Greek for Pelagus, and all I could find were the main and C, so it beats me. It's probably something really obvious, but I don't know. Somebody let me know down below. Anyway, Kongalala got an emerald subspecies, which was a greener, gassier version of the monster that is essentially an amped up version of the normal one. Seriously, it's just dropping death bombs all the time. Then Blangonga got a copper subspecies, which is a much more interesting one because it's the first subspecies in the entire series to drastically change its ecology from the base form. This Blangonga has lost its Blangonga pack and now lives in the desert regions of the world, trading its white coat and ice abilities for a brown coat and rocks. Lots and lots of rocks. And of course, there is Rajang who got its variant, Furious Rajang. You thought base Rajang was angry? Uh, think again. Permanently enraged Rajangs that have lost their tails, another Dragon Ball reference, potentially by their own hand, which is pretty gnarly. It's bigger, it's badder, it's pretty damn strong. And that about does it for Generation 2. Very monkey focused, I would say, but also very good, very strong and unique entries for this class. I think that the Fang Beasts or Pelagus or Primadius came out the gate swinging and immediately became iconic and unique. But the question is, how does the future of the class fare after Generation 2. Moving right along, we get to Generation 3, and the devs clearly wanted to diversify this monster class while still maintaining some sort of consistent theming. If we look at all the existing ones up until now, what do they have in common that sets them apart from other monsters? Well, they're mostly monkeys, yes, but more broadly, they're all based on... Anyone? Anyone? Mammals, yes, that's right. They're all mammals, whereas the rest of the monster classes have a tendency to be reptilian, you know, dragons and wyverns and, and, and that sort of thing. And so with our mammal basis established, we get the famous or infamous trio of Generation 3, along with the third and final name change slash translation to bring us to the still used Fang Beast title. Azeros is up first, a bear. It's a bear. A spiky blue bear, but a bear nonetheless. Azeros acted as one of, if not the first large monster you would go up against in Monster Hunter Portable 3rd, and as such, it was a first for the class. Having such an introductory monster be a bear, and not a raptor or other bird wyvern, was a breath of fresh air. It's neat. I don't have a problem with Azeros. It doesn't offer much in the way of challenge or complex gameplay as a result of being so low on the food chain, but it's not supposed to, and it's largely inoffensive and approachable otherwise, I would say. Azeros is okay. The same cannot be said for Legombi. Uh, Legombi sucks. I don't like it. It has to be one of, if not the most unremarkable monsters Capcom has ever approved to pass the concept phase. It is the second of the vaguely bear-shaped trio, looking like a mix between a giant rabbit and a penguin, and okay, fine, it's conceptually alright, but I, I just don't like it, dude. It's bad. One of the weakest Fang Beast designs in my, in my book, only beaten, obviously, by like, Bull Drone. I would say. And lucky last is the roly-poly boy known as Volvodon. 
You may have heard of it. Bovidon has some neat things going on design-wise. It's an armadillo for one, and armadillos are neat, and being an armadillo means its whole deal is rolling around. I don't know if armadillos actually do that in real life, probably not, but it makes it unpredictable and boasts the unique combination of paralysis and stench. It's, it's neat. It's annoying. I'm not gonna pretend it's not annoying, you know, it's, it's, at least it's a unique fight, I think. All right, these are not the strongest entries. So all of those fellas were introduced in Monster Hunter Portal 3rd, and that's all we were given in the third generation. Less monkey, more chunky. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. Not a huge amount of monsters, and I'm not the biggest fan of them individually, but you got to admit that it does begin to show what this class can really be. It demonstrates that it can kind of be anything. Fast and agile, slow and lumbering, introductory level, or expert level. And this fact only grows as we move on. So... Let's do that. Generation 4 gives us some great throwbacks to the classics, as well as one of the most diverse and largest additions to the roster we've gotten yet, so let's just get stuck in. There was only one brand new Fang Beast in Monster Hunter 4, and that was a brand new monkey, baby. My boy Ketchawatcha was another fresh addition to the class, being used as an early to mid-game monster that emphasized the verticality of the map. It's this bright orange lemur looking thing with huge ears and claws and a trunk. It's pretty agile as it swings through the vines, its ears come down to shield its face when it's enraged, and its trunk spits mucus at you. It can also glide with the little membranes under its arms, much like Toby Kadachi can. It's a good time, and I like it a lot. I do. I, li I like Ketchawatcha a lot. It then gets its own subspecies in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate in the form of the Ashen Ketchawatcha. It appears in most of the same areas, but instead of being orange, it's this washed out blue color, and it spits out flaming snot instead of watery snot. It's neat enough as far as subspecies go. Nothing outstanding though. Pretty, pretty standard, I'd say. Okay, so we've innovated on the monkey approach by making one that is far more acrobatic, and far less brute strength, which is a nice touch. Now, let's do the exact opposite of that. All brute strength and absolutely no acrobatics whatsoever. And also the monster that so happens to be my absolute favorite fang beast to this day, Gameth. Released as one of the four flagship monsters from Monster Hunter Generations, Gameth is super duper different to any other previous fang beast in the entire series. Being most similar to Bulldrome, I suppose, out of all things. As the name may suggest, it's a gigantic mammoth-like monster that is covered in red and blue fur, and it's just fucking awesome, man. It's just so cool. I always love monsters that are really different and fresh, and Gameth was exactly that, and it is a goddamn crime that it did not show up in the Hallfrost Reach. It would have been perfect there, and would have made a lot of sense. I reckon the only reason it did is because it is just so big. It's, it's, it was too big, I guess. Gameth is yet another peak in the innovation for this class, and my only critique is that I think it would have actually been really neat if it were classified as a herbivore instead of a fang beast, because then we'd have this large monster that's a herbivore. I don't know, that, that just sounds cool. But alas, it is not, and as such, it is in this video. Also, its battle theme is the best song that has ever come out of the Monster Hunter series, and that is a hill that I will die on. You can try to fight me, but you are wrong, and I am right. Now we, of course, cannot cap off the Generation 4 games without talking about Deviants. Azeroth and Legombi got Deviants in the form of Red Helm and Snow Baron, both of which are pretty underwhelming, I think, but I just kind of like Deviants a lot as a whole, so they get a pass, and rather rudely, Volvodon just did not get one. Yeah, feels bad, man. Then we, of course, got Elder Frost Gamma. Elder Frost is... Well, it's, it's, uh, it's just more Gameth. It hits harder, it throws more snowballs, it makes more earthquakes. It's pretty good, but fuck, it's big. It's apparently barely bigger than the normal one, but I swear to God that thing is, like, unimaginably gigantic and massive. I guess I'm just crazy. And, well, that about does it for Generation 4, so let's take stock before jumping into Gen 5 and beyond. This class began as being pretty much a bunch of monkeys, or more accurately, primates, so much so that it was originally called Primatius. We then diversified with some bulkier bear-like designs, and then went all in on both agility and bulk with two separate monsters in Generation 4. We are currently in a pretty phenomenal spot as a whole, so what does Gen 5 bring to the table? Generation 5 gives us some very interesting additions, more than I thought when I first started scripting this video. Some of them I really like, others not so much, but all in all, it's a cohort that only serves to push the class further into greatness. First things first, uh, there are absolutely zero brand new Fang Beasts in Monster Hunter World or Iceborne which is a goddamn shame because it would have been really cool to see some fresh ecology and something for this class. But at least Rajang got the new gen treatment 
I'll, I'll give it that, I suppose. All that said, where World drops the ball, Rise rises to the occasion. <laughs> yeah. It picks it back up and it runs with it. And so for the first time since Generation 2, we get a small monster fang beast as a little treat in the form of Bombadji. He's just a little guy, a little fella. A silly little dude. Entirely unrelated to any other large monster ever, Bombadji are based on a tanuki and are so full of gas that if you hit them, they explode. Brutal. We also, of course, got our first companion monster that isn't a Linian, the canines, or palamutes, if you will. These are dogs. They're good boys and girls that look like a mix between a Kelpie and a German Shepherd or like a Border Collie or something. I think they're a fun addition, if not a little less useful and fun compared to the cats as you get deeper and deeper into Rise, but... I do like that they aren't just anthropomorphic dogs. I, I think that was a good call. Enough of that though, we want to talk about the big monsters. First up is Bisherton. This guy feels kind of like what Ketcha Watcher would have been if the design goal was to just make it super annoying. It's a very agile monkey based on a Tengu. It stands on its giant gross hand tail and hurls fruit at you with startling precision. And where does it keep that fruit? In its gross little marsupial pouch. Yeah, it's fine. It's not great. But it's fine. It's it's okay. All right, so we're not okay with just fine. You want a great monster, right? Oh, don't you worry. You got it, pal. Next is that big, frosty, horrific boy known as Ghost Harag. Now this thing, this thing is fucking awesome. Ghost Harag has to be my second favorite fang beast just behind Gamoth. Primarily based on the Japanese Namahage with a little bit of Oni going on, it takes the bear-like body plan of things like Azeroth, the Gombi, and Volvodon, and it cranks it up a notch, spending most of its time fully bipedal, meaning that it just completely towers over the hunter, staring down at you with those piercing, beady yellow eyes. And of course, you can't forget the ice swords, they're the best part. Gosarag is an outstanding example of just how diverse monster design can be, not just in the Fang Beast class, but in the Monster Hunter series in general, almost being uncannily human-like at times. It's good shit. A plus. S even. The third and final Fang Beast in Base Rise before we get to Sunbreak takes the wind out of our sails a little bit because it's Apex Arzoros. Look, I've voiced my opinions on the Apex monsters in Rise plenty of times, and the fact that they are just the Deviants, but without any of the fun and interesting design elements or character behind those designs, is just such a bummer, man. It just sucks. It's a big, strong Azeros. Just do yourself a favor and go and verse Red Helm Azeros in Generations instead. It may be also be underwhelming, but at least it's better than Apex Azeros. And then along came Sunbreak to improve upon Rise in almost every single way, giving us the, as of right now, most recent Fang Beast to join the roster. The first one was a subspecies of Bisherton in the form of the Blood Orange Bisherton, which I must say, I do like a little bit more than the base form, actually. It shows up in a lot of similar areas to normal Bisherton, which is a little bit boring, but then again, Everything just sort of shows up everywhere in Rise. That's just how the game works. It is much more vibrant than the normal Bisherton, and it throws around burning pine cones instead of fruit, which, like, points for imagination there, I guess. Oh, and all of its materials are called orangutan parts, which is fun. That's just fun. They should have just called it that, I think. I think that would have been I think that would have been a good idea. And then of course there's the big guy. On occasion rivaling Gameth herself in sheer size, we got a brand new monkey. Garangom. The beauty of Garangom lies in the fact that they took the style of design that has previously been agile, small and fast moving, the monkey guys, and they turned that on its head by making an absolutely gigantic one. Its design is based on parts of traditional Jewish golems and Frankenstein's monster. Garangom is a visually impressive and fun fight. It's honestly a great example of the design team opting for quality over quantity because even though Sunbreak might have lacked a high number of entirely new monster designs, the ones we did get were truly special. And well, that's where we stand as of the recording of this video, but before we wrap up, I would be remiss to not at least mention the Fang Beasts that were exclusive to the spin-offs like Monster Hunter Frontier and online. I won't go into a huge amount of detail because I simply lack the experience with these monsters, but this will at least be a fun trip down memory lane for those that know about them, or a nice little insight for those that don't. Frontier's up first, and let's begin with Gogomoa, an actual spider monkey monster that could fire silk from its hands to restrain hunters grab objects from a distance and swing around the map. They often carry with them a baby known as a Kokomoa, 
And if you defeat the baby, Mama Monkey will go full berserk mode until one of you is dead. Which I think is a pretty fair reaction, honestly. Kamu and Nana Aragaran are up next. That's right, well before Rise did canines, Frontier did the dog thing first, and pretty effectively I must say. Kamu and Nono were a pair of wolf-like monsters that would almost exclusively be hunted as a pair. Kamu was a dark brown colour and had more aggressive features such as larger fangs and long quills running down its back, being more physically imposing. Whilst Nono by comparison was a snowy white colour and had less exaggerated features and strength, but is faster and more agile. Mitagaran is then the third dog of Frontier. It isn't technically considered a variant, unfortunately, but it is just a lone Kamu Aragaran that has mutated into essentially a brand new monster. It's sort of an enhanced version of Kamu, but with a bunch of fire attacks now, and it moves so fast that you just can't see it. So that's fun. Lolo and Ray Golgarth are yet another pair of monsters, but unlike things like Kamu and Nono and Rathian and Rathalos, these guys aren't a mating pair situation, but rather they are the same monster with a recessive and a dominant gene. Lolo is the blue one and Ray is the red one. These monsters use magnetism to manipulate the fight, using it to throw each other around and hitting you with some sweet ass fighting combos. Then there's Voljang, the origin species of Rajang. First of all, origin species are dope and I wish there were more of them. And second of all, think of a Rajang that breathes fire instead of lightning and is covered in flint-like scales that it will light itself on fire with. Uh, yeah. That's the Voljang. And then of course, there's the Zenith monsters. And for the Fang Beasts, we got one for Blangonga and one for Midagaran. Imagine the most juiced up, wild ass version of a monster you've ever fought, and then like, quadruple it, and that's Zenith. That's what, that's what the Zenith monsters are. All right, with one MMO out of the way, we next move on to Monster Hunter Online. We get a few interesting additions here. The first of which is of course, Caesar Burr, the big ass beaver monster, big old orange brown beaver guy. Caesar Burr was the representative early game monster for online and it seems pretty neat. I even got to fight it once. Very Azeroth adjacent. Caesar Burr also got itself a couple of variations, one of which was the yellow Caesar Burr, which is a very similar monster, but it just adds mud to its repertoire. And then there's the ghost Caesar Burr, which is like a hardcore version of it that has blood soaked hands and a tail and a missing eye basically just bigger, faster, and stronger. You then get the Slice Margul, which has got to be one of the dumbest Monster Hunter names I've ever heard. It's a dog monkey, and I didn't really know it existed until I was making this video. Apparently, they're quite similar to Blangonga and Rajang in terms of fighting style, punching and stabbing at you with their spiky arms. They also have a purple subspecies as well that adds poison and paralysis. So... That sounds fun. And the last couple of monsters are the Lone Species. Lone Species were a monster variation in Monster Hunter Online that were quite literally just solitary individuals that lived alone and adapted to such a lifestyle in a weird way. Don't ask me why these aren't just subspecies or variants, but I digress. There were two Fang Beasts that got the Loner treatment, the first of which was the Gold Kongalala. Best I can tell, this is just a Golden Kongalala that surrounds itself in a gas aura. And that is it. Then you've got the Flame Blangonga, which is red and orange instead of white, has a yellow mohawk and rocky arms, and it breathes fire instead of ice. That sounds, that, that sounds, that sounds pretty sick. I'm not gonna lie, it sounds pretty sick. All right, lads, let's close this out with a classic miscellaneous lightning round to just tick off the spin-off Fang Beasts, shall we? Monster Hunter Explore was famous for its crossovers, and so we got the Witch Lagombi, which was a crossover with Madoka Magica, the Enma Rajang, which was a crossover with Kometsu no Yaiba, Blackstar Beast Volvedon, which was a crossover with... I have absolutely no idea, and Christmas Volvedon, which is just a Volvedon dressed up as Santa Claus. Monster Hunter Stories gave us Kumashira, which was a mix between an Azeroth and Kumamon. And last, but certainly not least, we have the Nako Agul, which is a monster resembling a cheetah or a leopard from a little known Monster Hunter manga. That's pretty old, I think, and not the best manga around, but hey, you can go read it anyway, go for it. And well, that was certainly a marathon of information, but many monkeys later, we made it to the end. And damn if Fang Beasts aren't some of the most interesting and diverse monster designs that the entire Monster Hunter series has going for it. Everyone thinks of Wyverns and Elder Dragons when it comes to Monster Hunter, but there is so much more to enjoy here, and I feel like the Fang Beast class is so broad that they could make a monster design based on just about any mammal and have it comfortably fit in here without any worries. I liked them before making this video, and now I just like them even more. A huge shout out to my friend Skoy Skull for helping me out with a good chunk of the Frontier footage that's found in this video. Go and check him out if you haven't already. He makes some excellent Monster Hunter content as well. Let me know your favorite Fang Beast in the comments section down below, and what you'd like to see from the class in the future. I am out of here for now, folks. Hopefully not for another six months this time. 
but I'll see you later.